Evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AI. Very happy to welcome you to a, uh, a conversation, a discussion of Philip Klein's important new book, Fear Your Future. Um, Phil is the executive director, uh, executive editor, sorry, of the Washington Examiner. Uh, he was formerly the Examiner's managing editor uh, and commentary editor. He uh, has been Washington correspondent for the American Spectator, a reporter for Reuters. He's a graduate of GW, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and he holds a master's degree in journalism from Columbia, which is less okay, but still <laughs> acceptable to us here. Um, this book, which is Phil's second book, and I really highly recommend his first also on, on uh, conservative ways out of Obamacare, which I think if you read it now, you'd find that it, it foresaw the future in a powerful way. Um, this book begins from the, the simple fact that our society is always an evolving relationship among generations. Members of a middle generation are responsible for taking care of the young and the old, as the old ones took care of them, as the young someday will. But the relations among generations are never a simple matter, and a lot of our society's deepest and most complicated problems present themselves at the intersection of generations. And in this book, Phil argues that today's rising generation, particularly the millennials who are now rising into their full maturity in our society, have been in some important ways mistreated by their elders, left with unreasonable burdens of debt uh, and rising costs of living that stand in the way of their thriving. And these burdens and costs are sending younger Americans searching for political relief. And many are finding that relief in an increasingly radicalized progressivism that increasingly is comfortable even calling itself socialism. Their concerns are serious and real, he says, but the left solutions won't help them, and they need a different set of answers rooted in a different set of expectations. We'll discuss all of that tonight and think about what this uh, battle among generations tells us about the, the nature of our society, the condition of our politics now. Our format's going to be very simple. Phil will come up here and talk about the book some and walk us through some of the argument. Uh, he and I will chat about it briefly, and then we'll open that up to conversation uh, with you. So help me welcome Philip Klein. Well, thank you very much for uh, Yuval uh, for having me and for the kind introduction, and thank you everyone for coming out today. I know the weather is not great, and uh, you know it's a, a topic that I hope you know, gives everyone uh, some great holiday cheer. <laughs> um, basically, uh, in the, the book, as um, you've all uh, alluded to, um, I tried to write about the younger generation, millennials who are currently in their 20s and 30s. Um, and basically, I feel that in many ways, they've gotten a bad rap. Um, I describe them as perhaps the most mocked generation in American history. Um, and you don't have to look far to find the stereotypes all the time of millennials being snowflakes and sort of chomping down avocado toast left and right and, and bottomless mimosa brunches and all of this stuff. Um, but as I sort of looked into the data, I found that in many ways, millennials are, are getting a raw deal. And what my book, book focuses on is essentially um, two twin challenges. Uh, one has to deal with uh, the unprecedented level of debt that millennials are inheriting. And the other has to do with their uh, rising cost of living on, on many important uh, goods and services. And uh, basically, um, my fear is that uh, because of a lot of these daily struggles that they're going to find it, and the data would bear this out, appealing to uh, gravitate toward leaders like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders who are promising to wipe away and alleviate all of their problems, um, when in reality uh, embracing this vision of socialism or something, or certainly more in the direction of socialism, is only going to make the first problem I, I look at, which is the unprecedented debt, uh, significantly worse. And so um, I wanted to start off with a, 
and by just a sampling of some of the charts that I, uh, in my book, which try to convey this issue. Um, and the first is this, uh, which is based on Congressional Budget Office data. Um, and basically what you're seeing here is um, essentially American history told to, through the federal debt. Um, and what this is, is it's a measure of debt as a share of the economy dating back to 1790 from the George Washington administration out to decades from now. And what you can see from this chart is right where we are, which is at the tip of the sort of before the dotted line, is that uh, the level of debt we have now is higher than at almost any point in American history, higher than the Civil War, World War I, the Great Depression. The only time when it was higher was but for a brief period during World War II. Uh, and yet, during World War II, um, it was a one-time event. So once World War II was over, um, the, the, uh, the, we no longer had to spend as much money on the military. Um, it started leveling off, and by the time the baby boomers in the 60s were entering the workforce, uh, debt had retreated to normal levels. Um, now, however, uh, the debt is higher than at any other point, other than World War II, but it's actually on track to exceed World War II and keep growing and growing and growing. Now, what's particularly scary about this is that if you look at the previous P, you know, spikes in debt, uh, it's generally come during times when there's uh, a severe economic disruption or a major war. Whereas right now, we're in a time of relative peace. We have historically quite low unemployment rate, only 3.5%. So you expect, in these conditions, deficits to be shrinking. Um, but in reality, uh, they're getting, it's still getting much higher. Um, and it will continue to get higher. And this is another version of um, looking at the growth in federal debt breaking it down to the individual level. Now, what this does is it looks at um, shares, individual shares of the federal debt um, and charts that against um, median income for people who are 25 to 34 years old at various points since the 19, 1974 to recently. And what you see is that during that time, income did grow, go up. It went up around four and a half times. Uh, but during the same time, the debt has gone up 28 times. And you see that the debt is now far in excess of what um, median income is. So that just gives things a sense of sort of um, proportion. Now, what's causing this? A lot of people like to say that, well, it's just because We've just given all these corporate tax cuts, and we just need to get the rich to pay more. However, um, as I sh show here, um, that's not really what's causing the issue. Now, to be clear, there's no doubt that if taxes uh, were higher, that the deficits would be narrower than they are now. But what I did here is I looked at the historical average of debt and or the historical average of taxes and the historical average of spending. And then I compared that to the trajectory that's coming in the coming decades. And um, in the blue line, you see historical tax revenue. And the orange line is projected tax revenue. So you actually see that in the coming decades, projected tax revenue is actually going to be higher than what it is averaged historically, even after the Trump tax cuts. The purple line is historical spending, and the green line is where projected spending is going to be. So if you look at the orange line of projected taxes and the purple line of, of historical spending, you see that there's only a narrow gap between the end of the orange and purple line. That suggests that if we were able to keep spending in check, um, that tax revenues would naturally grow at the point where there would be very little uh, deficit problem. And I wouldn't have had to write this book, and we wouldn't be here. But instead, 
we have the green line, and you see the massive uh, gap that results and that keeps growing um, as far as the estimates go. Now, the simple reality is that this is being driven by spending, which in turn is being driven uh, by several factors, which is that the retirement uh, age population is growing uh, significantly relative to the working age population uh, when you compare to prior generations. So there, there are basically a way of putting it is that today's younger generations are going to pay, be paying for more retirees at a greater cost for a longer period of time than any prior generation. Um, and the, the issue is on top of the sort of retirement, you also have the fact that healthcare costs are growing. So you're, more people are retiring, but also Medicare is being driven off by the fact that healthcare costs are more expensive. And here you see this in this pie chart, which looks at the federal budget in, 20, in 1968 and in 2018. And what you see there is that the, um, the orange and blue parts are Social Security and Medicare. So in, at the period in 1968, it's a relatively small percentage. It's 16% of the overall budget. But now those two programs are taking up 40% of the budget before anything is spent on any other services. The, um, <clears throat> now, so the issue is that if nothing is done about the, about the, the trajectory that we have in the debt, uh, we're going to face significant um, crushing trade-offs between massive tax increases, massive spending cuts, or some sort of combination of both. Um, and economists talk about the possibility of a fiscal crisis, which is essentially when investors no longer feel comfortable purchasing US debt, um, or at least not at low interest rates. And they're demanding higher interest rates. And so you end up in this vicious circle where in order to pay for the, to borrow more money, uh, you have to do something to reduce all of the spending um, or to increase taxes. And, but if you do that so quickly, it's going to hurt the economy, which in turn is going to make it dampen growth and make it harder to pay off the debt and pay the interest rates. So the, the next set of issues that I, I look at in my book is the uh, issue of the personal costs. And basically, millennials, um, in addition to the fact that they're inheriting a, a large federal debt, um, are facing financial headwinds. A lot of them retire, uh, graduated college into the Great Recession, where jobs were hard to come by. Um, or they had to settle for lesser jobs or gig economy jobs, and they've had a harder time building wealth and preparing for retirement and trying to, to build families than prior generations. Um, millennials are buying homes later. Uh, they're getting married and having kids later than prior generations. And while there are certainly cultural factors we can talk to about that, it's hard to deny the economic factors, and one of them as I, as I note here, is the tremendous growth um, in housing costs. Um, and as you see there, the housing costs have grown, uh, as demonstrated by the green line, the housing costs have gone up significantly at a faster clip than growth in income. Now, it has been noted by a number of economists that the, if you look at that houses have gotten bigger over time. And that actually, if you look at things from a, a square footage basis, that house, housing prices haven't actually gone up that much. The problem with that is that if you're a young couple trying to build a family, it doesn't do much good for you that 
you can get that there, if there are only six bedroom houses on the market. If, you, if there's fewer sort of three bedroom starter homes that are smaller and that you're willing to, to fit into, uh, then it doesn't really do you very good if the per unit cost of square footage is lower. Now the other obvious 800 pound gorilla, which is the subject uh, of a, a lot of debate is student loans and, and tuition. And in this, this is actually uh, a chart of the growth in college costs. Um, this is a private, this is for private colleges, but public colleges have also gone up on a similar trajectory. Um, and what you see here uh, is that adjusted for inflation, it's a lot more expensive to go to college now. Now, there's, uh, is, the thing is that um, back you know, decades ago, it was easier to get a decent paying job without a college degree. Uh, but there's been a lot of work that's been done, including um, uh, by Lyman Stone, uh, some work he did for AEI, about the fact that there's been a massive increase in credentialing and degree requirements associated with various lines of work. So on the one hand, people are, there's more pressure for people economically to go to colleges, but at the same time, they end up entering the workforce with um, tremendous student loan debt. And um, as I note in this table, if you look at consumer debt, student loans have now surpassed auto loans and credit cards uh, and are now the second largest consumer loan. Um, however, the problem is more acute than that because the student loan, while auto loans and credit card debt is spread among the entire population, student loans are heavily concentrated among people in their 20s or 30s. Um, so, if you, so, um, if you look at this chart, what this looks at is sort of retirement uh, um, planning. And so, one of the consequences of the various problems we have with our long-term debt and with the social security system and with the state of Medicare is we don't know to what extent we'll be able to support the obligations that we currently have for future generations. But yet, at the same time that that's happening, um, because of student loan debt and all of the other costs we talk about, um, it's, it's becoming more difficult for millennials to save for retirement, and of course, you want to start saving for retirement early in, because the earlier you start, compound interest could work. You could um, invest in more uh, aggressive growth-oriented investments. Um, but that's more difficult. And this looks at um, male workers. I also, in the book, have a chart about female workers. That's a little um, uh, change, uh, affected by the fact that it, you know, in the past several decades, obviously, more women have, have entered the workforce. Uh, so in some sense, looking at male workers is, is a bit more consistent. But what you see is that at every age group, millennials are participating in retirement plans uh, at a lower rate than either Gen X or uh, late baby boomers. Um, and this is sort of showing up in the, this, the inability for millennials to build wealth. Um, and this is one of several charts I have in my book that sort of demonstrate it. This looks at the wealth to income ratio. And you can see at virtually every age pairing, um, late boomers represented in blue um, were had more wealth than millennials at a similar age. Um, and so right now, the way the political environment is, is that neither party actually cares about the federal debt issue because um, the Democrats have a very ambitious social agenda and it's not convenient for them to try to figure out 
a way to, to explain how they're going to pay for it. They'd rather talk about what they see as the merits of various proposals. Um, and Republicans have historically shown that they're only interested in addressing the federal debt when a Democrat is in office. Um, and certainly one of the, the parts of sort of the Trump brand of populism is that um, he's not uh, interested really in tackling the debt or doing anything about entitlements. Um, and some of this has to do with the way the political coalition is working now because um, as younger voters turn away from Republicans and they become more dependent on older voters, they're more reluctant to do anything to change programs like Medicare and Social Security. And um, now, so the issue is that looking at these sort of twin challenges is that Democrats are coming along and if you, you look at these, the problems that millennials are facing, you could see how it would be appealing if somebody comes along and says, you're worried about your student loan debt, I could zap that away. You know, we could give you subsidized housing, free health care. Um, and so the, the, there's clearly, it's, it's clear why they would be motivated to go that way and feel like the government could just take it, you know, take care of all of their problems. But clearly the, the problem is that the, the type of proposals that Democrats are talking about are of several orders of magnitude larger than what, what is, you know, has ever been contemplating before. I mean, you just take Medicare for all, uh, which is, uh, has a cost uh, of $34 trillion over, the, over a decade. Um, one year of Medicare for all is more expensive than a decade of Obamacare, which we spent 13 months debating and which was you know, a massive disruption to the healthcare system and to American politics. And that is an inkling of, of just one proposal uh, of the Democrats. And so I think that um, my book sort of presents challenges for both sides, which is one is I think that um, people who are conservative need to do a better job advancing and articulating more market-based alternatives that speak to some of the struggles that the younger generation um, is facing. And it's easy to sort of dismiss their problems as sort of whiner that they're whining and it's an overly pampered generation. Uh, but a, the, the sort of risk of that is that if they think one side's ignoring their problems, it, it's even more likely that they'll gravitate to the other side. Um, and I think that conservatives also and Republicans have to get more serious and rekindle their interest um, in trying to do something um, to address this longer term uh, debt problem. Um, and um, happy to continue in discussion. Thanks very much, Phil. A great Thanks. overview of, of a, a great and important book. Um, I thought I'd start by asking you about what seemed to me to be a, um, a kind of duality in the book between the two sorts of concerns that you say millennials are feeling. Um, one is about the debt. The other is about cost of living pressures. Do millennials actually feel the pressures of the debt, or are you saying they should feel those? I think it's more saying that they should. Um, as I point out in my book, it's sort of human nature to be more focused on the short term. And for millennials, the, if they're, they're frustrated that they can't purchase a house and they're sending, forking over hundreds of millions, hundreds of dollars a, a, a month on to pay off student debt. Um, and they're thinking about hanging kids, but they are looking at the staggering cost of childcare and they're, they're worried about that. Um, those are sort of very real problems that they're facing in their daily lives. So it's more difficult to break through 
and say to them, oh, well, you have to be more concerned about the debt problem, which is decades from now. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think it's sort of incumbent of those of us who don't agree with socialism to sort of lay out an alternate path to address some of these concerns so that maybe we could reach some people in this generation to say that um, you know, they should worry about all, you know, the long-term debt. And I think that it's difficult if Republicans and conservatives are simply dismissing their concerns to then make the argument about the debt, which sounds like, you know, cynically, it sounds like a scam to mm -hmm. deprive them of being right. able to have their problems addressed. You, you have to tell them that they, sh you have to help them worry less about their immediate financial pressures and get them to worry more about longer term financial pressures. Is, there, is that imaginable as a political agenda? Is there a <laughs> politics that does these two things at the same time? I mean, I think that it's, it's, there's a way to do it in terms of, I mean, on healthcare, for instance, I think that that's one example where um, I think conservatives have really failed to make the case because if there's ever a policy of where government expands and it hurts, it disproportionately hurts younger people, it would be Obamacare. I mean, Obamacare has a, is a policy which basically it, it it's forces younger and healthier people to subsidize, to pay significantly more and purchase a lot more insurance than they need so that older people could get more affordable insurance that's mm -hmm. more comprehensive. Um, and it's simply, um, if you look just simply at that matter, um, it would be much more logical if you had a system where you said, we're gonna have something like high risk pools or some sort of pooled resource that if we decide as a society we have to cover with people with pre-existing conditions and so forth, that that risk is sort of shared by everyone as opposed to saying a few million people in the individual market who are primarily young have to subsidize the entire cost of paying for people with you know, more significant condition. And so I think that if you look at um, a lot of market-based reforms, which I know you've obviously done a lot of work on um, and I've written about previously, that a lot of those market reforms also improve the outlook for Medicare. And so I think that there are probably ways to, um, to do it. I mean, it's certainly tricky politically. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I were to, you know, obviously this is sort of, um, this book, writing this book, is to try to get to make the case and present the data, and make the argument that people should be worried about that. Um, but I'm sort of not uh, Pollyannish about the reality, and the reality is that sure we're much more likely to just continue on autopilot until we reach some sort of crisis, and then we, you know, govern in, in a crisis scenario. Do you think a politics that dealt with this would have to be explicitly rooted in, in the language of generational warfare? I mean, it, once you start helping people see that what we're doing is moving money from the young to the old, which in our society means moving money from people with less to people with more, since the, the old are the wealthy in our society, generally speaking, haven't you opened up a politics where the entire structure of the American welfare state is basically a, a, a target of a kind of youth politics. Yeah. Is that but, the goal? I mean, I think that the issue is that I think some element of generational warfare is justified because we've had decades of um, the government, you know, redistributing money instead of the rich, from the rich to the poor, as is often criticized, but from the young to the old. And the reality is that you know, people say, well, these retirees, they paid into the system, but that's a lot of mythology that's surrounding the program. And the, the 
when, as I, you know, in that one chart, where you look at the growth in the burden on Social Security and Medicare, um, basically, oh, you know, more than doubling um, in the time as a share of the overall budget, that means that the resources that um, younger Americans are, have to pay for for older Americans is significantly higher than what um, previous generations were being asked to contribute. So the, um, and I have another chart in the book where I look at um, the question of um, looking at the difference between lifetime tax contributions to Social Security and Medicare mm -hmm. versus lifetime benefits. And at almost every, except for at the very high, in, you know, higher income levels, basically at almost every combination you come up with, people are extracting more than they paid in. So yes, it's sort of a, a tricky, ugly thing, but I feel like it's not like our politics now is, is rosy, and so I feel like it, some generational warfare would be healthy to sort of rebalance a, um, you know, some sort of fair or di fair distribution among how much our government is dedicating toward various generations. Mm -hmm. that, that language of generational warfare in the book is directed to the baby boomers. Um, and there's a lot of that now. Um, are the baby boomers at fault for this system? Is that the right way to think about it? How did this happen? I, I think the baby boomers are, now you could say, well, Social Security basically and Medicare came along before baby boomers and so forth. But what I think, why I think a lot of resentment is justified toward baby boomers is, um, as I noted in that one graph on sort of debt, by the time baby boomers came out of college and or high school entered the workforce, that debt was pretty much paid off. They had a much smaller, uh, they had to pay for a much smaller burden than the younger generations. Now, um, they inherited, certainly there were times like the 70s where there were economic uh, problems, but they inherited an expanding, growing America, which, you know, in the early day, you know, the earlier part of their careers had less foreign competition and so forth. And the, they knew this whole time, for decades we've known that this time was coming where they'd be retiring and they'd be putting a strain on the system. And they were in power for decades. So they had the ability to say, well, we're in power, we should, it's, it's, it's not fair, it's immoral for us to be just dropping all of this into the lap of the future generations. We inherited debt uh, around, let's say, 36% of GDP. We've more than doubled it. Um, you know, we have to do something about it. Um, we've had baby boomer president. I mean, if you technically Obama was within the, the confines of a baby boomer, people tend to just think, Mm -hmm. of the baby boomers more as the early baby boomers, but technically it was 19, 1946 to 64. So basically we've had baby boomer presidents since 1993. So they've been in power and they could have made a lot of changes that would certainly make things a lot easier and they haven't. So that's why I think that it is, it is, um, uh, you know, we're, and I also think that, in another sense, um, there's this sort of instant gratification mentality that dominates our politics, mm -hmm. and both sides suffer from it. On the Republican side, and you know, I'm a big fan of Ronald Reagan, but one of the things that I think I'd criticism on, him on is that I think he did long-term damage by enshrining this idea that. You, you could have, you could cut taxes and drastically increase military spending and do nothing about entitlements and everything would work out fine. Um, and even though Reagan was not a baby boomer, he certainly, 
exemplified a lot of that instant gratification mentality. And he governed when the baby boomers were sort of entering their, you know, their 30s and 40s and entering their prime earning years and so forth. And that's kind of been the template if you look at George W. Bush's presidency and certainly uh, President Trump, that's sort of been the template. And of course, the one break from that was uh, George H.W. Bush, who you arguably lost his presidency when he decided to raise taxes. So I think for Republican um, presidents, they definitely have this, these competing models. Like I can be more like Reagan and kind of give everyone what they want or tell people to eat their vegetables and, you know, and be like Bush and be a loser. So uh, to me, I think that that, uh, that instant gratification element, I think, is problematic, that in politics we don't have people who say we can't have everything. What, what's the argument that things haven't gone fine in that period? What do you make of the case that the 21st century in the US and in the rest of the West should temper our worries about debt? That we actually don't necessarily pay a price if if, if we're not in a situation like Greece or uh, Southern Europe, which we're not, um, why couldn't this be sustained much longer? I guess I'm skeptical of that um, for two for several reasons. One is sort of the common sense reason, and that it doesn't make sense that you could just borrow money forever. You know, the sort of modern monetary theory argument that if you're issuing debt in your own currency, you could never, you could never have a debt crisis mm -hmm. because you could always print more money and worry about inflation later. Um, I'm sort of skeptical at the idea that the same situation is sustainable forever. Now, most economists would say that you can't predict exactly at what point a fiscal crisis would come. Is it 100%, 125%, 130%? just that you're increasing the odds greatly. Um, now, if, if you, to, you know, sustain ever rising levels of federal spending. Now, it is true that if you look at the last decade or 15 years or so, that it has challenged a lot of what we would have, textbook economics that we would have you know, grown up with, not just in debt. I mean, we're in a situation, when I was, studying economics in college, we talked about full employment and the right. idea that, well, once you get below 6%, 5.5%, 5% of uh, unemployment, you have to start worrying about raising rates to mm -hmm. worry about inflation. About inflation. And now, now we're at 3.5%, low interest rates, no inflation, and so forth. So For I, a long time. Yes. But my question is sort of, I, I kind of feel like, there's a few things. One is that the debt, as I noted, is, un, is there's no precedent for the debt that we're going to, to, to see without changes. So in terms of both the magnitude and duration of the federal debt levels, we can't, we can't we've never experienced it mm -hmm. yet. So basically, each side is essentially making an argument without a re real reference point for this staggering level of debt. And there are certainly certain plenty of situations like Greece or, I mean, if you want to go back further, look at how many revolutions were caused by debt. I mean, the French Revolution, arguably, were certainly a major factor was them being left over with this tremendous debt after you know, the American Revolution and so forth. And if, if you go through revolutions in history, certainly debt, you know, debt has, so it's not like we have no precedent for things getting more, you know, debt becoming a problem. And also, I just think that the economy provides countless examples of things working irrationally for a certain time period. But usually, they don't behave irrationally forever. And if, if it's 20, 30 years from now, and we're still looking at virtually no interest rates, and our debt is you know, 150%, um, I, 
you know, be more willing to revisit it. But mm -hmm. part of me, I could just kind of feel like you know, with the housing bubble for years, it was, it seemed to be going up at an irrational standpoint. And you had some people worried about derivatives and so forth. But Greenspan was saying, oh, well, we, we have regional housing markets, so it's not really something <laughs> to worry about. But then eventually this sort of irrationality um, ended up bursting the bubble. And I think that in um, another example is the dot-com bubble, right? And, I mean, it wasn't, let's say, over a 10-year period, mm -hmm. but certainly in the 90s, if you would have said in, let's say, 1997, that you think that the you know, dot-com stocks are way overvalued, you, know, you might have been right in the long term, but if you sold you know, stocks short in 1997, um, by 1999, you would have been lost your shirt completely. You wouldn't have gotten to 2000 when everything uh, collapses. So I guess ultimately I'm still a believer in the fact that things can't remain irrational forever. So this, th that kind of argument in order to persuade the, the millennial generation that you're speaking to would have to also help them address the cost of living pressures at the same time to reduce federal debt over time and to reduce the growth of cost of living in these areas that you mentioned in the book, healthcare, housing, higher ed. What does that look like? What does that? Well, it, I think isn't that another way of saying you can have it all? You could argue that, um, but I think that there are also ways to argue where you might address some of these issues where, in other words, it doesn't have to be the same policy that simultaneously addresses the federal debt or housing. You have to have policies that address the federal debt and policies that address individual issues. So as an example, you know, on housing, I think even before you get into the whole argument over you know, Democrats want to subsidize housing or and you know, limit rent to a certain percentage of your your mm -hmm. um, your income. There are things, for instance, on zoning and permitting, where I believe that there's room to increase dramatically the supply of affordable housing. And I think if, and granted, we're in a crazy political environment where both sides wouldn't want to agree, you know do something together even if they ostensibly could agree on it. But I think that that's one area where you have um, you know, the, the Trump administration you know, under Ben Carson, um, Housing and Urban Development has you know, put out report on, pointing to the problems in terms of permitting um, and in terms of uh, you know zoning problems and how that's a big factor in affordable housing, and um, Cory Booker in an otherwise very expansionist proposal talked about the you know the problems in terms of zoning and affordable housing. So if you did something like that, there are issues on the regulatory front that I think would at least help. Um, some of the issues without impacting the debt while you could, that could happen independently from actions that you take on the debt. So when you talk about the, the kind of concerns and anxieties that are driving millennial voters to the left now, your emphasis is really on the economic. You talk about these two sets of pressures, the burdens they're being left with, the costs they're facing. What about the, the non-economic pressures they confront, the social breakdown that we find in some parts of our society, weaker families and communities, weaker religion? Where, how does that play into their politics, and how does that connect with these kinds of pressures and with the sort of politics that's possible with millennials increasingly being the dominant force in our, in our, in our political life? I mean, it's interesting. It's obviously that's something my colleague at the Washington Examiner, Tim Carney, has written and done some uh, great work on, um, as well as you have. Um, I guess the, I think that I'm sort of not necessarily a fan of, there's only one, there could only be one explanation for any kind of type of behavior. <laughs> and I think that the, 
there, I don't necessarily think one explanation is incompatible with the other. And I think, for instance, you could see how some of the economic issues are also very interconnected with some of the social trends. Um, as I noted, if it's harder to figure out a way to, to afford to raise a family or to buy a home, it's, you're going to delay the family formation, um, which is going to have all of the issues associated with the, the various social isolation. If you have a so-called gig economy, then that's more likely to have people um, have trouble um, you know, forming uh, you know, a sort of if the, the stability that comes with having a consistent job and a group of people you work with. Mm -hmm. And if you, I think that the, this sort of social isolation could manifest itself politically by supporting somebody like Donald Trump if you're of a certain mindset, or you could see why it, the message of, let's say, a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren could also appeal to people who feel, for different reasons, this sort of social dislocation, this idea that, well, we're all a community and we're going to solve each other's problems together. Well, I want to open things up for questions. Um, I'd only ask that you tell us who you are and uh, do try to pose your question as a question. Um, we'll have a microphone going around just a second. We can start there in the back. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that you're, uh, sorry, did you hear the first one? Richard Reeves there from the go. Brookings Institution. Um, your task here, it seems, your goal is to uh, use the debt apocalypse to scare millennials away from socialism and public spending. And the cover of your book, um, you know, with that great chart, does that by not adjusting for uh, inflation. Um, but I do right. have charts that <laughs> I know the, the ones you show good. didn't, but nonetheless, I, I take I take the task seriously. My question is whether actually inadvertently you don't actually play into the hands of those arguing for uh, increased public spending, partly because of the difference between personal debt and national debt. The thing, the big public spending programs the Democrats are suggesting are not aimed at older people. They're aimed at Medicare, the thing the old people already get for all. They're aimed at reducing college debt, which is squarely aimed at the young. So that plays, I mean, I think picks up on Yuval's point, that plays squarely into the very anxieties that you tap into. And so it seems to me that whilst you're trying to scare them away, actually by confusing the two issues of personal debt and national debt, you might scare them towards. And towards. And I wanted to push a little bit on the college debt point. You put up the figures for um, private non-profit colleges. Well, fewer than one in 10 of those who go to college go to those colleges. Most middle-class kids go to community college. The numbers are much lower there. And so there you are playing exactly into this kind of upper middle class fretful di uh, group um, that it seems to me a lot of the Democrat proposals are aimed at. If you read Beth Akers in the Wall Street Journal today, she makes a very good job, I think, of demolishing the arguments for universal debt repayment. And so I just, I, my fear is that whilst you're trying, to, you're trying to push people away from those big spending programs, you end up pushing them towards it, partly because you're singing some of the same tunes. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the feeling that I have is I'm not necessarily you know, um, like a politician who's trying to um, feel like um, only making the sort of partisan point. I just tried to look at the data and I feel like I could acknowledge certain problems. And it's certainly in the, in the book, I look at sort of public, um, public um, nonprofit too. I was just, uh, giving just sort of a sampling of some of the charts and data in my book, um, just for time constraints. Um, but I guess just as a researcher, I wasn't going to necessarily um, not show certain data just because I feel like it wouldn't play at all. I mean, I, certainly I could have written a book that just looked at the debt problem and not considered any of the other individual concerns, um, but I do think that 
there is something to be said for um, the increase in, in student loan debt in terms of the, what the ramifications are. I mean, I'd also argue that the um, debt repayment plans don't make a lot of sense. I don't think it's fair to people, firstly, who spent a lot of time paying in and paying off their debts and making all sorts of sacrifices to pay off their debts to suddenly say it's, it's done. Um, I think that it also, what we saw with um, student loans is that one of the big reasons for the increase in college costs was the expansion of federally subsidized student loans. And there's a lot of research bearing that out. And I think that you'd probably see something similar if you'd see debt repayment where people would feel that they could take out more debt because eventually the government is just going to repeal it. Uh, so I guess you could argue, well, I don't want to acknowledge that certain things are problems because it may hurt my ability to make an argument. I just sort of tried to, to present the data, honestly. It, isn't it true, though, that the, the, what the Democrats are offering now is increasingly about rebalancing the demographic imbalance in our welfare state? They just want to do it by expanding the welfare state on the whole so that it reaches younger people as well as older people rather than being a, a system of transferring money from younger people to older people. Yeah, although they're not really, they're basically, they're doing the flip side, which is that we're just going to expand it for everyone because they're right. also saying... Medicare Bernie for Sanders. All is, is more than Medicare for All. It's a way of saying we address the demographic imbalance by treating everyone the way our welfare system, our welfare state has treated the elderly. Yeah, but at the same time, they're also promising that seniors are going to get... Um, you know, free now they're going to get their uh, free vision care and mm -hmm. long-term care paid for, and um, all. And um, so they're they're basically no premiums, no pay. So they're basically saying that the medic underlying Medicare new Medicare program is going to be more generous than the existing program, and we're going to give it to everybody. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of not saying that we're going to rebalance things in the sense that um, we're going to, you know, like older Americans are going to have to sacrifice some so that more benefits could accrue for younger generations. They're basically saying that it's old, you know, that it's yeah. basically everyone's going to get more. Let's take a question right here. Thank you, Tim Carney. I work at AEI and the Washington Examiner, so it's good <laughs> to see you. I want to know your, your response to sort of the, the David Harsanyi response at the end of the book, which is actually the millennials should stop complaining. And that, I mean, for instance, they all carry around supercomputers uh, their whole adult life in their pocket. Uh, and even if you look at the median wage chart you have there, which uh, median wage for 25 to 34 year olds is higher now than it was at any point where you and or I, we're all Gen Xers here, me and those two, uh, where, where you or I were 25 to 34, adjusted for inflation, median wages are higher now than they were in that decade of, of our life. Throw in the fact that, you know, cancer, uh, again, David talks about cancer, AIDS, et cetera, all on the decline. The social indicators um, that, that are really the most depressing have to do with um, suicide and middle-aged death, which again, Gen X is losing and the millennials aren't suffering from that. So isn't it a f a f the fact that they actually really do have it a lot better off um, than we did and certainly than uh, our parents did? I mean, I, this is the correct kind of generational warfare, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that the, um, you know, as I noted in my response, I think that there are certainly factors that you could point to that are good, you know, in terms of, you know, iPhones and advantages and so forth. But I still, I guess, am sympathetic to a lot of the, the various costs that I write about in my book. And I feel like, and this gets it to some bit to this question too, I feel like if basically the response among people who believe in limited government is to just sort of laugh 
and dismiss anyone's problems and say, just suck it up. I mean, millennials are going to be the largest voting block, if not in the coming election, you know, in we're just in an, another election cycle or two. Um, they're, they're, in terms of the adult population, they're about to become the largest adult population. So I feel like just sort of dismissing all of their complaints basically guarantees that we're going to end up living under some form of, of you know, a European style social welfare state. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jeff Edelstein. I'm a senior consultant with the Consensus Building Institute. And um, I have maybe two questions, if I can. Um, so one is, you know, when you talk about the housing issue, one of the things that I think about is, yes, housing costs are sky high now. However, that wealth is owned by people and is actually owned, I think, by lots of the parents of the millennials. And so I don't know the numbers, but I certainly know people talk about we are coming up on the largest transfer of wealth that we maybe have ever seen. Um, and if we take the 1946 start for baby boomers, which means those who are 73, um, not to be too morbid, but they're not really dying off yet. So I don't know, you know, I don't know all those numbers, but we're just at the beginning of that transfer of wealth. So s lots of those homes will go to the next generation. And I think of that a lot of the wealth, um, student loans, the wealth that's owned by banks, uh, by corporations is actually in the assets of the boomers through their equity holdings. And so I, I guess my question is, how does that play in? Is, is there some way that that is part of the solution? And I'm not necessarily saying a state tax. I'm, I'm just thinking we are seeing a huge transfer that's going to take place. And I'm just wondering, is anybody really looking at how that plays into this, both on the national debt and also on these other issues? And just the one other thing, if that one's too wonky, my other one is I'm very interested in where the trade-offs are on these giant issues. Um, I actually think as long as we have electoral cycles that are less than maybe 20 years, we will never get politicians to overcome the human nature of instant gratification. Um, I am wondering for those who are, shall we say, more pure conservatives who care about the fiscal responsibility, what, you know, what would you trade, say, for a balanced budget amendment to the other side, if you will? Um, because I feel like those are the things that maybe we have to look at in, in order to really reach these grand bargains. Let's think about that first question first. It, it's, it's always striking how much of the logic of our politics is premised on the notion that the baby boomers are going to live forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of our arguments about these questions, too, ignore the fact that the, 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 those charts about the growth of Social Security, there's actually a point there where the growth slows a lot, and that point is coming. Um, when that wealth transfer happens, it will be a wealth transfer to exactly the people you're talking about. Are, are you telling a story in the middle that actually looks a lot better in the next chapter? I don't know. I mean, I guess in terms of the, the sort of wealth transfer issue, I guess I mean, part of it is that there's not, you don't have detailed enough data to know who's getting, who's going to get the, the wealth transfer. I mean, is is somebody the, who has, you know, a baby boomer who has like a multi-million dollar house that they're going to, you know, give to their kids, is that the same, you know, millennial who is sit, had to take out 50 grand in student loans? I don't, I don't know. It's, po it's possible. I just don't know if the data exists at that detail to know exactly where it, you know, where the wealth gets transferred to and how much it sort of, you know, impacts some of these daily um, issues. Um, and um, in terms of, remind me of the second question. What, what are you willing to trade for better? Well, trade. I mean, I think the difficulty is that if, you know, if, if I had written this book sort of, you know, in 2011, I think it mostly would have been sort of on these, you know, what the various solutions are. 
Um, but now that we've moved into a period where you know people no longer you know people no longer want to think of the debt as an issue at all. Um, most of, more of my focus was on trying to argue that it is an issue and a problem that it needs to be addressed. And the solutions are, even though while very complicated and fraught, I mean, we ba it's basically a simple math equation. You know, you either raise taxes to some degree, raise spending to some degree, um, or sorry, cut spending to a certain degree, or some sort of combination of these factors. Um, and it's just for me, it's just I feel like we have a long way to go until we can debate those various trade-offs. And I think that you have to first have people that are dedicated to solving a problem and who aren't you know, as interested in using as a political cudgel any position that the other side takes. Um, I think if I were writing this 10 years ago, I'd say never under any circumstances would I agree to you know, raise taxes at all because the, I don't think things are dri driving to taxes. If, if there were a situation in which we were actually serious about doing something, and that were part of the equation, certainly like I'd be amenable to that. It just sort of depends on whether or not it's part of a solution that would actually, you know, really resolve or at least, you know, substantially, you know, go a long way towards resolving the issue. Hi, I'm UT. I'm from the Washington Free Beacon. Uh, thank you again um, for this presentation. So, you know, your conceit is basically socialist debt funded expansion doesn't work. It's going to ruin us uh, millennials in the long run. Fair enough. You kind of hinted at the uh, free market solution as an alternative, but, you know, that, that kind of, that free market neoliberal solution kind of got us here in the first place. So, I wanted to ask you an opinion about. Uh, what do you think about, you know, national conservative, uh, you know, policy prescriptions that's kind of been coming up that are perhaps not debt funded, um, at least they're closer to uh, budget neutral, um, but involves government intervention, whether that be an industrial policy that prioritizes gr having more working class jobs in the United States that pays well for millennials, or, you know, say, regarding the housing cost, you know, a lot of those housing costs is going up because foreign, foreign moguls are coming in and buying up properties in these, you know, really nice urban areas, uh, purely for speculative reasons. Um, clamping down on that sort of, uh, current, you know, uh, capital, is there, you know, capital control, is that, a, is that a solution? So, obviously, you can always make the argument that this sort of thing will inevitably affect the GDP and indirectly affect revenue and increase the debt, but you know, they're at least not directly debt funded. So what do you think about that sort of national nice conservative solutions? I mean, I'm generally skeptical of the, a lot of the sort of arguments in terms of national conservatism. I mean, my view is sort of, um, sort of traditional, I guess more libertarian in the sense that um, to me where people are born, um, isn't as important as what the contribution is. And I don't, I don't necessarily, so to me, the, uh, um, I guess I'm less oriented toward trying to um, craft economic policy in a way that distorts the economy out of the idea that it would benefit people who are native born in America. Let's take a question up here. Thanks, uh, Jason Russell, Washington Examiner. Uh, you talked about uh, you know government solutions to this problem. I'm wondering, uh, you know, what steps on the individual level should millennials be taking to you know prepare for debt apocalypse? <laughs> I mean, I've actually <laughs> thought about how the. A, a natural, if I were to write a sequel, it might be on how, okay, our, our politics is so messed up that this 
is never actually going to get resolved. Uh -huh. So gold. it's sort of prepare for the crisis, <laughs> and it's sort of like 10 solutions uh -huh. for preparing for the crisis. Um, I think that's a good question, and I think I would say that certainly I think that if I were um, you know, millennial planning looking toward retirement, I would assume that you can't depend on what the estimated Social Security benefits are um, and basically plan very conservatively. So you think retirement. we'll have a politics that reduces people's Social Security benefits between now and the time you retire? I, I don't, I mean, I'm just, if you look at the actual fiscal trajectory, um, the uh, basically, if we actually reach the point of a fiscal crisis, we don't actually, we have less choice over how we end up um, getting, um, you know, uh, we have less choice over how the problem gets solved. So some of the trade-offs I spoke about in terms of taxes versus spending, we don't get to have that argument because effectively <clears throat> a lot investors might impose solutions on us. So I think that um, it's certainly, I think that retirement should be planned conservative. Now, the flip side of this is that I have a friend that says, well, it's pointless to, to try to be responsible and save because if there is some sort of solution, they're going to do means testing. So if you've retired for, you know, and have saved well for retirement, then you're going to you know, have your Social Security benefits slashed. So um, whereas it's the people who didn't save, um, that's why I think that you know, any <coughs> sort of means testing might have to take into account some sort of earned income while you're, you're working years as opposed to what your retirement income is. Because basically, if you have person A and person B, and they both earned the same amount of money, but person B had more savings because they were you know, more careful in savings, um, then I don't think that should be sort of penalized. So if you're, if you're advising the post-Trump Republican Party about how to talk to this generation of voters about this problem, where do they start and what do they say? I mean, I think that it has to start by acknowledging so, you know, some of the you know, problems that they're facing and not just buying into the LOL, this is the snowflake generation. And I think that that sort of mentality and that mockery, and certainly when you know, I've been discussing the book and talking, doing a lot of sort of talk radio, a lot of feedback I get from the conservative world is just sort of laughing, you know, laughing off anything, everything. And I, I think that if they continue to do that, I think that I think there's some hope that, um, as with previous generations, as they get older and have families, they'll become more conservative, um, even though they're liberal when they're younger. However, the data is not showing that so far. The data is showing that the liberalism of millennials has been, has had more staying power. Um, and so I think that will continue to be the case as long as Republicans kind of lean into the disaffection of millennials with the Republican Party and sort of just brush off all of their concerns. Well, that's our time. Let's thank Phil Klein. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil, for being here.